The tears Nelson Shaw shed when we sat down for this interview in August after his longtime girlfriend Lily Sue was murdered. This past August, uh, Lily Sue, she was a well regarded dentist in Oakland. She was shot and killed in Oakland's Little Saigon. The Oakland Police Department's homicide investigators have worked this investigation tirelessly, diligently following up on dozens of tips from our community and exploring all investigative leads. A prominent Oakland dentist killed in broad daylight in what appeared to be a random shooting. The victim's longtime partner left grieving. In a city already plagued by senseless hate crimes, the police chief urged citizens not to let the incident divide communities. But when investigators dug deeper, they found that perhaps this shooting was not so random after all. I'm your host, Dr. Top Hat Shadow, and this is The Shadow Self. Oakland, California. A beautiful city with a rich history, a melting pot of cultures, and an idyllic climate. Located across the glistening bay from San Francisco, Oakland is home to scenic walks, great entertainment, amazing fried chicken sandwiches, and delicious pho. The city of Oakland, better known by locals as the town, has many vibrant and attractive areas. But it is also a city that has long grappled with crime. And since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has endured its share of violent crimes, directed towards members of the Asian communities. Crimes that have forced business owners in places such as Chinatown and Little Saigon to change their hours of operation, hire security, or in some cases, shut down altogether. It was a warm summer day in late August. A good time of the year to enjoy Oakland's renowned Mediterranean-like climate. As per usual, people were out and about. However, tensions had grown in the city, as residents were in the midst of a rash of random attacks and robberies, committed specifically against members of the AAPI community. Many community members, particularly the elders, were on high alert, and felt the need to be extra cautious when they went outside, even during the day. 60-year-old Lily Xu and her longtime partner, Nelson Chia, had gotten into a black Mercedes-Benz and driven from another part of Oakland to the Little Saigon neighborhood, located adjacent to Oakland's Chinatown. It seemed like a typical day for the couple. However, what Lily did not know was that she too would soon become victim to a violent crime. Lily Xu had come to the United States from Shanghai in 1995 and had lived in the Bay for decades. She worked hard to establish a successful dentistry in the heart of Chinatown, where she was well loved by her friends, her staff, and her patients, many of whom also became her friends. Those who knew her described her as a kind and passionate person who was a bright pillar of the Chinatown community. She discovered a love for ballet and in her later years joined a ballet school so that she could live out her passion. According to Nelson, after running a few errands, he and Lily had driven to Little Saigon for a pre-planned massage appointment. But as they parked near the corner of East 11th Street and 5th Avenue, a white sedan pulled alongside them, and a man got out. As Lily exited the passenger side of the black Mercedes, the man approached her, brandishing a gun and pointing it at her. Lily screamed, and a struggle ensued. She turned her back, and the man shot her multiple times before running back to his car and fleeing the scene. Nelson, who had not completely exited the Mercedes yet, was unharmed. Emergency medical arrived soon thereafter, but tragically, after arriving at the hospital, Lily was pronounced dead. The brazen killing sent shockwaves through the city, particularly the AAPI community. A vigil was held, in which both community and council members expressed their outrage. City Council President, Nikki Fortunato Bars, released a statement calling for justice for Lily. I am outraged and sickened over the senseless brutal slaying of an elderly AAPI woman in broad daylight this afternoon. There was an attempted robbery in the middle of the afternoon, and she was shot and killed. What does it say about our community when we cannot walk down our own street, visit a neighbor, or enjoy a picnic on the lake on a Sunday afternoon? We can and must do better. No one should presume they can come into Oakland at any time and commit a violent crime without repercussions. The police chief made the case a top priority and asked the public to share any information they had which could help them track down the gunman. Homicide investigators went to work on the case and they soon found a potential lead. 
They discovered that a building across the street from where the shooting occurred had a surveillance camera that was pointing directly at the corner where Nelson and Lily had parked. Often is the case that surveillance cameras are seeing but not recording. However, investigators got lucky and were able to obtain footage of what exactly happened that day. We must warn you that the following may be distressing to some viewers. As had been described by Nelson during his police interview, a white Lexus pulled up alongside the couple and a gunman emerged, circling around the back of their black Mercedes before confronting and shooting Lily. The shooter then got back in the car and the driver sped off. Detectives also noted that the shooter touched the trunk of the Mercedes before approaching Lily. Based on what detectives were seeing in the footage, it appeared that this was indeed a case of an attempted robbery turned homicide. But they still needed to find out who that gunman was. A Tesla, which records the road while driving, happened to pass by, and police were able to get the plate numbers of the Lexus. They then tracked the vehicle to a dealership in Stockton, where they learned that a man named Hashim Basin had been in possession of the vehicle on August 21, the day of Lily's murder. The forensics team processed a fingerprint that was found on the trunk of the Mercedes, where the gunman had placed his hand, as well as three spent shell casings found at the crime scene. Both contained Hashim's DNA. Hashim was a Bay Area resident who had been involved in the local activist community. He'd appeared at rallies and had even appeared in an Occupy the Farm video. A social movement founded in protest of the planned commercial development of public land and in support of preserving the land for the creation of an open center for urban agriculture. He was involved at a local tennis stadium, helping out on the court, coaching newcomers, and even competing in the ITF men's circuit tournaments. Based on his history, Hashim did not fit the typical robbery homicide suspect profile, and investigators had a hunch that there may have been more to the incident than just a robbery gone bad. If their suspicions were correct, they would need to find a deeper connection between Hashim and Lily. Or perhaps, between Hashim and Nelson. Nelson was described as somewhat of an eccentric man. He moved to the United States from China and worked as a legal consultant for nearly 40 years. But in 2014, inspired by Andy Williams and Perry Como, he decided to take up a new career as a singer expressing that he'd always had the desire to be on stage performing. He began managing a weekly open mic venue, in which audiences would pay a small fee to watch him and other amateur singers perform. Up until her death, Nelson and Lily had spent over a decade together. Lily's loved ones organized a memorial for her, at which Nelson took the stage and sang Frank Sinatra's You Never Walk Alone. It was, in the opinion of some attendees, a little lord. Meanwhile, investigators kept a close eye on Nelson. Investigators had interviewed Nelson right after the shooting. He described the incident in detail, and his description matched the video footage. But after evidence pointed them to Hashim, they began suspecting that Nelson knew more than he was disclosing. They asked him to come in for a second interview. Nelson complied, but this time, instead of questioning him about the incident, they asked about Lily's financial standing. Under pressure, Nelson explained that Lily had around $14 million worth of property and assets from life insurance policies, trusts, LLCs, real property, and bank accounts. Now, a new light was being shed on the case, and investigators pressed Nelson to tell them more. They asked him who would gain control of Lily's estate, now that she was gone, and he informed them that the trustee was him. He then disclosed that he stood to immediately receive about $1 million from the life insurance policies. This was good information for investigators, but it wasn't enough to prove that Nelson was complicit in the crime, nor was it proof that he knew Hashim. However, after some initial digging, they paid a visit to the tennis stadium where Hashim used to coach. They spoke with someone there and discovered that not only was Nelson Cheer a member, but he had frequently hired Hashim to hit with him the dots were beginning to connect. But, they still needed to find solid evidence that Nelson was directly involved in the crime. And their best bet would be to obtain cell phone records from his wireless provider. Once again, their due diligence paid off, 
Nelson's phone records revealed that he and Hashim indeed communicated outside of the tennis court. In fact, the two had communicated starting in July of 2022 and continuing on through August, the same month that Lily's murder had occurred. According to the warrant, detectives then discovered further communications between Nelson and Hashim. These would prove to be a big win for the police and extremely damning evidence for Nelson. Allegedly, the two openly conspired to murder Lily for the purpose of financial gain. They also reported that Hashim allegedly coached Nelson on how to behave during a police investigation, advising him to appear distraught and to continually act like the victim. He told him that should he be asked to identify anyone in a photo lineup to say he didn't recognize any of them. Detectives suspicions had finally been proven correct. Subsequently, a search warrant was served at Hashim's residence in Sacramento, where a number of firearms were recovered. After sending the firearms to ballistics, one of them came back as a match for the weapon that was used to kill Lily. Nelson had allegedly promised to pay Hashim $100,000 to take the life of Lily Shu. The warrant closes with the following statement from the arresting officer. Based upon the foregoing, I believe the following. Nelson Chia conspired with Hashim Basin to murder Lily Shu for financial gain. Basin agreed to commit the murder. Chia agreed to provide Basin with a significant amount of money for murdering Shu. Chia and Basin planned the day, time, and place of the murder. Basin acquired a vehicle, recruited a driver, and waited to ambush Shu a block from the location of the appointment. Chia drove Shu to the agreed upon location. Immediately, upon Chia and Shu's arrival, Basin's vehicle pulled up next to Chia and Shu. Basin exited the vehicle, went straight to Shu, and shot and killed her. Chia gained control of Shu's assets and accounts, with the intent of paying Basin at a later date. Accordingly, I believe that Chia and Basin committed murder, in violation of Penal Code Section 187A. I also believe that the murder was intentional, and carried out for financial gain, and that the murder was committed, by means of lying in wait. Nelson Chia was booked into the Santa Rita jail, located about 30 minutes outside of Oakland. Though the name sounds more like a vacation destination than a prison, Santa Rita is the fifth largest jail in America, housing over 4,000 inmates. It's a county jail, and most people are there awaiting trial, for crimes which they've been accused of committing. Some are there for petty crimes, such as trespassing or auto burglary, while others are there for violent crimes such as kidnapping, armed robbery, and murder. Those accused of more violent crimes go to the West Wing, where they cram together into heavily guarded cell blocks. Not exactly the kind of place Nelson would fit in. Nelson was facing a murder charge with a special circumstance, meaning that he'd allegedly orchestrated a violent crime in order to make a financial gain. Evidence against him was strong, and if found guilty, he would spend the rest of his life in prison. And technically, that is exactly what happened. Nelson was being held in a single man cell. He hadn't even gone through processing yet, but on day one in Santa Rita jail, a little after 2 p.m., guards found him hanging motionless in his cell. They proceeded to try and revive him, but were unsuccessful. Hashim Basin currently faces the same charges, as well as enhancements for the intentional and personal use of a firearm to commit the crime, as well as for lying in wait. He is currently held in Santa Rita jail, and has entered a plea of not guilty. Time will soon tell. After taking his own life, Nelson Chia's eldest son gave an interview, in which he said it felt as though a weight had been lifted off of his back. He described his father as having been physically and mentally abusive to him as a child, and he said that Nelson was completely devoid of the ability to empathize. Lily Shu was a beloved friend to many, and pillar of her community. She had accomplished a great many things in her life, and still had so much more to go. Her death sparked outrage, not only in Oakland's Asian community, but throughout the Bay Area. Those who spoke out after her passing, expressed a tremendous appreciation for her, emphasizing that she was a person full of light and compassion. Tragically, she had been taken advantage of by a deeply narcissistic individual, who schemed a way to take what she'd worked so hard for, attempting to make it his own, and dispose of her life in the process. She leaves behind the sun. There are some who are incapable of feeling empathy. They completely lack the ability to understand the feelings of others. And thus, in order to function in society, they develop the ability to mimic the behaviors of an empathetic person by studying their behavior. 
They carry, shall we say, a large mirror. They can live an entire lifetime, socializing with people, developing relationships, marrying, and raising children. Yet, all the while, they do not feel a level of compassion for people. They are out of touch with their shadow self. And even if surrounded by many, they live in isolation. What are your thoughts on the case? Leave your comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell icon. I've been your host, Dr. Top Hat Shadow. And this is The Shadow Self.